Energy is key to our prosperity and well-being. But we need to reduce the use of fossil fuels because they produce greenhouse gases and contribute to climate change. A sustainable energy mix is the answer. And fusion can be a promising long-term option. Fusion is the energy that powers the stars. Our sun is the source of life and light on Earth. It's also one of nature's biggest fusion devices. In its core, hydrogen atoms move at incredible speed. Due to the high pressure, they collide and fuse into a heavier atom, helium. The reaction releases lots of energy in the form of light and heat. This is what we call fusion. Fusion can be a limitless source of energy. The fuel it requires is abundant, reducing the risk of any geopolitical tension. It does not emit any greenhouse gases. Fusion machines are inherently safe, pose no risk to nearby populations, generate no long-lasting waste. To replicate the fusion reaction, we need to crush two types of hydrogen. Because they're both positively charged, they tend to repel one another. On the sun, due to the strong gravitational forces, hydrogen atoms fuse at 15 million degrees Celsius. On Earth, however, they would need to be heated to temperatures as high as 150 million degrees Celsius in order to collide and produce a hot gas called plasma. For decades, scientists have been trying to produce fusion energy through various experiments. They came up with the idea of producing a super hot plasma in a toroidal vessel, then capturing it with powerful magnets to keep it away from the walls. This is how the tokamak was born. Europe is working together with six countries to build ITER, the biggest fusion device to help us get closer to this new energy. Think of nuclear power and many imagine the worst. Atomic bombs, reactors melting down, radioactive wastes. There's no denying that the history of nuclear is fraught and the dramatic and disturbing moments hard to forget. But for the most part, nuclear energy operates out of sight and out of mind, generating about 10% of the world's total electricity. This represents 29% of all the world's low carbon power and 55% of the United States' low carbon power. Nuclear reactors generate energy day and night and produce no greenhouse gases. But overall, the growth of nuclear is slowing in comparison to other low carbon sources like wind and solar. Nuclear power plants are expensive to build, construction often takes longer than expected, and debates over how to handle radioactive wastes rage on. What's more, public opposition to nuclear power is strong, especially in the U.S. But we're in the midst of a climate crisis, and many energy experts argue that despite a contentious history, nuclear has a key role to play in our energy future as a stable, always available source of power. Some experts are working to upgrade existing nuclear power technology, that means designing safer and more efficient fission reactors with the support of philanthropists like Bill Gates. But government labs, private investors, and intergovernmental organizations are also devoting vast resources to what many consider the holy grail of energy, 
nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the same process that powers our sun and every other star in the universe. And if we can figure out how to harness that power here on Earth, it would be a huge game changer. Nuclear fission was discovered in late 1938 by a pair of German researchers. They found out that when you bombard uranium with neutrons, the nucleus splits, forming two lighter isotopes and releasing mass that gets converted into energy. The discovery paved the way for the development of the atomic bomb in the United States. And after the infamous bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, concerns over nuclear proliferation spiraled as the global nuclear stockpile grew during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. But in 1953, President Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program attempted to shift the focus of nuclear power toward peaceful energy generation, and much of the world started building nuclear power plants for civilian use. Private industry quickly jumped on board, especially in the United States. And by 1991, the U.S. had twice as many operating nuclear power plants as any other country. As of 2019, about 450 reactors worldwide operate in 31 countries. And some countries, such as France, Hungary, Slovakia, and Ukraine, get more than half of their power from nuclear energy. But over the decades, a number of high-profile disasters have stalled the industry's momentum. In 1979, the partial meltdown and ensuing radiation leak at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania cost about $1 billion to clean up. The disaster stoked public fears about nuclear power. Stricter safety standards were imposed, reactors became more expensive to build, and fewer were built. The nuclear disasters at Chernobyl in 1986 and Fukushima Daiichi in 2011 led to further scrutiny of the industry, as concerns mounted over the long-term effects of the radiation exposure. And then there's the battle over where to store nuclear waste. One proposed site, Yucca Mountain in Nevada, has been hotly contested for over 30 years. Yucca Mountain is unfit as a repository site for nuclear waste because of the impact it would have on national transportation. The current state of the industry remains mixed. Countries such as China, India, and Russia are building new reactors at a fairly fast clip. But in the United States, more than one-third remain unprofitable or face closure. Only one new nuclear reactor has come online in the U.S. since 1996, as costs and construction times in developed economies have spiraled. Next-generation fission technologies are much safer than reactors of the past, and some proponents claim they'll be cheaper, too. The general public may still need convincing, but one idea has outlasted the controversy, the promise that someday nuclear fusion will provide a better alternative. Scientists have been researching nuclear fusion since the 1920s, ever since they learned it's what powers the sun. In a fusion reaction, extreme temperatures and intense pressure cause hydrogen atoms to fuse together, forming helium atoms. In the process, the atoms lose some mass, which is converted into vast amounts of energy. The reaction could produce four times as much energy as nuclear fission, and nearly four million times more energy than burning coal or gas. But after decades of research and billions of dollars, scientists still have not found a way to create a sustained fusion reaction. That's created a not-so-inside joke among scientists, that fusion is the energy source of the future, and always will be. But some think these questions and jokes overlook the real progress that's been made. Fusion has traditionally been the purview of government labs like Lawrence Livermore and Oak Ridge. But more recently, a number of private companies have thrown their hat in the ring. This includes General Fusion, which aims to bring a commercial reactor to market in the 2030s. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos is among the company's investors. And then there's the large multinational effort that's underway in the south of France. Called the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, the project aims to create the world's largest and most powerful fusion reactor. While all of these players are competing for resources and funding, that could actually be a good thing for the nuclear power industry overall. General Fusion, founded in 2002, operates out of a nondescript office park about 20 minutes outside of Vancouver. Unlike most government labs or academic institutions, General Fusion is focused on implementation over research. The company's goal is to build an electricity-generating fusion reactor in the next decade or two. Jeff Bezos was an early investor, and the company has now raised over $120 million, with about $90 million coming from private investment and $30 million from the Canadian government. General fusion combines two common approaches in the industry. Inertial confinement, which subjects the fusion fuel to extremely high pressure for a brief amount of time, 
and magnetic confinement, which uses modest pressure for a prolonged time. When heated to extreme temperatures, the fusion fuel becomes a plasma, a state of matter similar to gas, except that it contains charged particles that allow it to conduct electricity and respond to magnetic fields. Our compressor is going to be a big sphere, about four meters across, uh, 15 feet across on the inside. And into that big sphere, we are going to put liquid metal. And that liquid metal, we're going to spin around in a circle so it opens a hole. And into that hole, we're going to put our fuel, which is hydrogen gas. It's preheated up to a few million degrees. And then all around the outside of this sphere is a big array of pistons driven by compressed gas. So they push on the liquid metal, and they collapse the hole with this fuel trapped inside. And that collapse happens very quickly and compresses the fuel up to fusion conditions. The peak of the compression, the fuel ignites and gives a fusion reaction. That energy goes into this liquid metal. So the liquid metal heats up. You take this hot liquid metal out, you run it through a heat exchanger and you boil water and make steam. And the steam drives a turbine to make electricity and puts it out on the grid. And we just keep pulsing and, and do that over and over again. Right now, General Fusion's main components, like its plasma injector, piston array, and fuel chamber, all exist separately. Delage wants to integrate them into one large demonstration reactor, a process he estimates will take about five years. A space roughly this size would fit a power plant that would be enough for 100,000 homes. And when the reactor goes online, LaBerge says it will bring General Fusion's cost of power into competition with coal and renewables like wind and solar. LaBerge hopes it will eventually become cheaper though, a likelihood if the U.S. decides to implement a carbon tax. But some industry experts believe that private companies like General Fusion are being overly optimistic with their timelines. Nuclear fusion is hard. No research group or company has ever been able to reach the so-called break-even point, at which the energy released from a fusion reaction is greater than the energy required to heat the plasma used in the reaction. But basic research is the bread and butter of Lawrence Livermore National Lab. It's been researching fusion since its establishment in the 1950s. In 2009, the lab opened the National Ignition Facility with the goal of achieving break-even and ultimately igniting a fusion reaction. Lawrence Livermore is pursuing inertial confinement fusion. That is, confining plasma at extremely high pressure for a very short amount of time, using high-energy lasers to do so. We're standing in what we call our target bay, looking at our, our target chamber. The target chamber is a, a big ball, about uh, 30 feet across. And at the very center of that ball, we put a very tiny target about the size of the tip of my finger. And we irradiate that target with 192 of the world's most energetic lasers. Researchers at the National Ignition Facility and other national labs have access to enormous computing power, allowing them to run complex simulations that help them understand the exact conditions necessary to reach ignition. And so based on our best simulations, they say that a facility of this scale is big enough to create this, this runaway reactions if everything works nearly ideally. But clearly, getting everything to work perfectly in the real world is much harder than it looks on a screen. So it could very well be that neither the well-funded, research-oriented national labs nor the scrappy, goal-oriented startups are going to solve the fusion puzzle. It might just take an international effort. The ITER project, originally known as the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, originated nearly 35 years ago at the Geneva Superpower Summit. Now, China, the European Union, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the United States are all working together to build what would be the world's largest tokamak reactor, the donut-shaped device used for magnetic confinement fusion. Currently under construction, ITER's tokamak reactor will be twice the size of the current largest machine, and aims to produce 500 megawatts of fusion power from 50 megawatts of heating power. But Henderson says ITER is poised to surpass previous efforts simply due to the sheer scale of the proposed machine, which builds upon already established technologies. Unlike General Fusion's ambitions, the immediate goal of ITER is not energy production, though the project does have an eye towards eventual commercialization. We'll start building the actual tokamak itself, which is about 20 yards in diameter and about 20 yards in height. And that device should be completed around the 2024 period, and then targeting to go nuclear in the 2035 period. So by 2040, which seems a long way, we will have gained all the information that allows the next generations to build demos. 
Henderson hopes that these demos will achieve ignition, opening the door for industrial-scale reactors that generate electricity for the grid. It's a grand vision, but even if ITER hits all its targets, how to translate that into a commercially viable reactor remains somewhat unclear. Henderson says it's impossible to say right now what a fusion reactor would cost or if the price point would be competitive. There is, however, a price tag on ITER itself. And while it's not cheap, it's not necessarily exorbitant for an undertaking of this magnitude. ITER is going to cost roughly about $20 billion. It costs roughly about $120 billion in today's money to put Neil Armstrong on the moon. So we're a fraction of that cost. And yet what we're offering is countless of generations, a clean, basically limitless energy source. It's stupid we don't do this. Despite the project's obvious potential, funding for ITER can be intermittent and unreliable, as countries like the United States frequently change their contribution levels in tandem with their election cycles and energy budgets. Not everyone thinks fusion is so integral to our survival. Public opinion on nuclear fission remains split, but many within the industry say the controversy is undeserved. Microsoft's Bill Gates is one of these proponents. He's intent on building safer and more efficient fission reactors to reinvigorate the industry. In 2006, he founded TerraPower, a nuclear reactor design company that's working on building new generation four reactors. Levesque also says TerraPower's reactors are walk-away safe. That means that during emergencies, the plant will cool and stabilize itself without an operator present. Furthermore, Levesque says the plant produces 80% less waste and requires less uranium enrichment, allaying proliferation concerns. But getting new fission technologies off the ground is an expensive endeavor. So companies like TerraPower want government support, both to build out their tech and to help them compete with cheaper power sources, such as natural gas. The U.S. government does this all the time. They did it in the case of hydraulic fracturing. They did it in the case of wind and solar. And now it's time for the U.S. government to help demonstrate the next phase of nuclear technology as well. Levesque estimates that building TerraPower's first demonstration reactor will cost more than a billion dollars, ideally funded through a public-private partnership. So here's where we stand. Fission proponents want to upgrade existing nuclear power plants and technologies. Fusion researchers say projects like General Fusion and ITER need more investment from both public and private sources in order to turn nuclear fusion into a reality. And climate change activists say the world needs to decarbonize using the resources we have now, before it's too late. We need to turn to fission, turn to solar, turn to wind, turn to geothermal, turn to hydroelectric, do whatever we can to get off of the carbon addiction. Then, if the research and investment comes to bear, we can turn to fusion to support our rapidly growing population. How soon we'll reach this fusion-powered future remains up for debate. However, these estimated timeframes may rely heavily on how much government decides to invest in fusion power.